are you? <laughs> Great question. So my name is Red. Um, I work here at Blue Stockings Bookstore um, and Cafe and Activist Center. Um, I'm also our zine project coordinator. Um, so I do a lot of zine buying and research for the shop. Um, I'm a queer non-binary femme. I use they, them pronouns, um, and I've been doing community activism and organizing for as long as I can remember. Um, and so I try to bring that experience um, and that kind of focus into the store and into the, the zine buying and consignment that we do. Very cool. And what is Blue Stockings? Blue Stockings Bookstore and Cafe is a activist center. It's a community center. Um, we're a bookstore. You're going to find books here that you wouldn't find in other independent bookstores. We're unapologetically feminist. Um, we are collectively run and volunteer powered, meaning everyone here is donating their time and labor and love and energy to keep the space um, looking the way that it looks, keeping the lights on, and keeping um, our spaces safer and accessible to all of our community on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Very cool. And describe your role exactly. Sure. So part of the project area that I'm involved in with the bookstore um, is zine consignment. And so I do a lot of research. I do um, zine buying. I do a lot of outreach um, to zine making folks, zinesters as we call ourselves, um, to build that community and grow a, a section of zines that is now expanded into the display that you see um, over here to my left and also some more zines that we'll be looking at later. Very cool. So. Um Tell us a bit about your zines and you know what are they and, and why do they matter? Sure. So zines are an incredible ephemeral object. Um, zines, I think, are really important for subcultural expression, for do-it-yourself DIY culture making. Um, what zines give us is a democratic and accessible way to get our ideas into other people's um, possession, right? And so because they are paper objects, because they are by nature more affordable than larger texts, they're more affordable um, than, say, you know, the kinds of other tomes that we would want to take home with us to do our political education and learning. They're more approachable um, for a lot of people. Um, they are more affordable, and they're going to be passed around just by the nature of their like ephemerality, their fleeting kind of, but also tangible quality, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so the thing that I love so much about zines is that they get two more people. They can, um, you can make copies of them. You can distribute them yourself. Um, and there's really this kind of independent and, yeah, like popular in that sense of from below power of spreading and sharing knowledge and ideas. Mm -hmm. Do you have any background on the history of them that you'd like yeah, to share? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I could spend hours and hours going through the history of zines um, with people because I'm totally um, impassioned and obsessed with zines and zine making. Um, some of the most exciting history, I think, comes from the sheer fact that they are so much a part of independent subcultural expressions of folks, right? I mean, you could even trace zines all the way through pamphleteering and, you know, spreading what was considered like seditious and subversive materials, right, to get ideas that were anti-war circulating. Um, even during the Nazi occupation in Germany, there were student-led movements um, who were circulating their own literature and their own zines. So in independent popular movement spaces, there have always been these ways, right? I mean, you could go back to the French Revolution even. Um, and I think that tracing this kind of radical trajectory of the history of zine making or pamphlet making and spreading independent thought um, is really powerful for us um, to keep in mind as we are still living in this legacy of getting ideas um, into other people's hands who might not have had access to those kinds of ideas before. I can think of right now the um, f origin of the zine, like the word being used in that way, coming from the 1930s science fiction fanzines that were happening in this country and, and really like where sci-fi was taking off, um, so also in the UK. Um, and Riot Girl. I mean, we can't talk about zine making without talking about the Riot Girl movement um, in the US. Um, subversive, sexy, angry, frustrated um, folks who are making punk rock and doing it their way. Mm -hmm. And getting their ideas about feminism, about sex, about like chaotic, generative creativity 
two other people who were just as fed up and frustrated with the music scene and with punk um, not being black or brown enough, um, even though black and brown folks are making punk rock, punk rock not being queer enough and not being like, not centering women and femmes, um, even though women and femmes are making punk rock, you know, and so being able to take those stories, create and distribute um, these ideas, these feminist ideas um, and leftist ideas about music and culture, that certainly is a, is a hallmark moment, I think, in this country in particular, where we see an explosion of distribution of zine materials. Um, another person that I think I have to give like a shout out to is an amazing abolitionist educator, um, scholar, organizer, I mean, always throwing down for community, is Miriam Kaba. She's been making zines since she was like probably 15 or 16 years old. We carry some of her recent zines with us here. Um, she's a native New Yorker. She's involved with Survived and Punished New York, Project Nia, and I could go on and on about her amazing contributions to zine making culture. Uh, and I think it's not a coincidence that we sell and carry probably a dozen of her titles and they're our most popular titles because her black feminist and abolitionist lens and principles, you can feel them as you're reading her zine. And that's just part and parcel of that kind of um, that kind of energy we want to keep and maintain here in the space. Very cool. Yeah. Um, describe and show some of your zines in your shop. Okay, great. So I'd love to show and share some zines um, that we're carrying right now and titles that have been incredibly popular. Um, just to begin, um, Selfishly, one of ours here, is from the Support Hose Collective, of which I'm a part. So it's a benefit zine, and um, you can see here, so it's Support Hose, this is a year one. It's a benefit zine and a yearbook zine that kind of chronicles the collective's organizing um, toward freeing our incarcerated comrade, Alicia Walker. And all the proceeds go to supporting her commissary needs while she's incarcerated. Um, she was locked up for defending herself and protecting the, her own life and the life of a fellow sex worker when they were attacked by a client and she's been incarcerated for that act of survival. And so we make zines, our collective makes zines to raise money and also to raise awareness about sex workers' survival tactics, our needs to fight back, and also to raise awareness about how many sex workers get caught up in the criminal legal system because of their survival strategies, right? So that's one of our zines. I was talking about Miriam Kaba earlier, so I've got one of the publications um, that she's a part of creating with Project Nia beautiful zine called um, Community Safety Looks Like, and it just goes through beautiful photo kind of responses and essays of people saying, you know, community means we have to believe that all children are our children. We have to rely on relationships to resolve conflicts. Community safety looks like no cops, no guns. Um, and it's just this like beautiful, beautiful um, collection of responses. I have another one here, also a title that Miriam Kaba has given us. Um, it's so beautiful. Um, it's called Taking the First Step, 10 Suggestions to People Called Out for Abusive Behavior. So it's a beautiful zine that's actually trying to hone in on restorative and transformative um, practices, depending um, on what's going on and what's needed. And it's focusing on the person who has caused the harm, right? As opposed to putting the onus and the burden on the person who has survived or experienced the harm, right? So it's this beautiful um, zine that's just looking through strategies and tactics to responding to that harm, right? Um, it's such a great zine. We've been carrying a lot of Hassan's work um, recently. We have a soil of one's own, scorched rice, which is beautiful and homophobia part two. This zine has just been like, I mean, the cliche, right? Selling like hotcakes. Um, they're all these like beautiful and intense and powerful reflections on relevant topics. Um, and so I love bringing this one into conversation. Another zine that we have just been, I cannot keep it on the shelf. I think I have, this is my last copy. I order these in batches of 10 and 12. It's called Don't Hate My Heels, A Confrontation with Whorephobia in Which the Whores Win. It's an award-winning zine, Broken Pencil, um, awarded the zine. It has collections of essays and writings um, by and for sex working people. It's phenomenal. And a few others here. I'll just mention one um, other title. Um, Dine, Our Survival is Bound to Theirs. 
It comes with like beautiful seed packets. Um, this is distributed by Authentic Creations and we get so many of their beautiful zine titles which are focused on both land reclamation and indigenous struggle, um, health and environmental issues and concerns. And they're just like these beautiful talismans of resistance um, and people really resonate with their titles um, that we distribute. Based on what you've told me, I'm guessing anyone and everyone can be a zine maker. There's everyone, yeah. There's no class that you need to take, although there are plenty of zine making classes you can sign up for to hone your skills. Um, pretty much all you need to do is have something to say. Um, and this is a medium and a method for folks um, that is by its own nature accessible and engaging. There are even digital zines. There are um, no text zines. There are all text zines. There are black and white Xeroxed lo-fi zines and there are like opulent yes. art and everyone can make them and everyone should. And my last question was yeah. just, who's your typical customer and sure. what's their motivation to buy these zines? Yeah, I think a lot of folks come to Blue Stockings looking for community, looking for resources, especially as they are addressing issues that are coming up in their own neighborhoods, in their own lives. So I think folks who are looking for queer, feminist, um, they're looking for things that are sex worker positive, they're looking for things about prison abolition, um, they're looking for things that are going to be speaking to their queer or trans um, experience. I think that people who are trying to seek out their own political education come through our doors. And even people who accidentally wander in will more than likely leave with a, a beautiful um, artifact of radical culture. Okay, so my name is Victoria Law. I use she, her pronouns. I am a freelance journalist and an author of, uh, author of books about incarceration, resistance, and gender. And what made you write Tenacious? So Tenacious began in 2002. I was corresponding with several women in Oregon's women's prison, the Coffee Creek Correctional Facility. Uh, some of them had been set, arrested and sentenced in the 1990s when Oregon's women's prison population was exploding. And, it, um, and there wasn't enough room for women in the existing prison. So Oregon contracted with private prison corporation, Corrections Corporation of America, which is now Core Civic, which has been in the news about its immigrant detention centers. But at the time, uh, CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, was operating a men's prison in Arizona, and Oregon contracted with CCA to send 70-something women to Arizona, and there they were uh, sexually assaulted, sexually abused, physically assaulted uh, on a regular basis, and they got word out to their family members to call the media and they ended up mounting a publicity campaign and a media campaign to be transferred back to Oregon where the prisons were not great but at least they were closer to home and they weren't subject to the pervasive and rampant sexual and physical abuse that they had been in Arizona. They also then filed a lawsuit against uh, the Department of Correction and CCA resulting in a public apology, the firing of about three dozen guards who had taken part in the sexual abuse and a settlement which covered all of their attorney fees. Um, so this was the context. Uh, fast forward to 2002 and I'm in touch with several of these women and they'd been introduced to zine culture, particularly prison zine culture. And at the time they were, what they were reading were zines about men in prison and written by incarcerated men and they weren't seeing their own struggles reflected in these writings. So they were seeing writings about uh, staff brutality or the lack of work opportunities or not being paid for their work, but they weren't seeing threats of sexual abuse by prison staff. They weren't seeing 
uh, pieces about how to parent from prison. Uh, over 90% of women in prison are parents to children. Many of them were minor children when they were first locked up. Um, they weren't seeing any of these issues covered. And so they said, well, we want to start our own zine, which would reflect our experiences and be a way to connect with each other, even if we're in different prisons across the country. People in prisons are not allowed to write to each other directly. It's considered inmate to inmate correspondence and it's forbidden. Um, so it was a way to be able to communicate with each other about what they were going through and perhaps share strategies and tactics, not only for survival, but resistance as well. But being in prison, they didn't have access to copying machines, postage, correspondence. They obviously couldn't write to people in other prisons to solicit their stories or input. So they needed people on the outside to be able to do this. And so they asked me if I would be willing to be that outside person. And I said, yes. I asked around. I asked several other women that I, young women that I knew who were interested in prisons, prison support and prison abolition, but also wanted to work with women if they would be interested in collaborating on this project so it wasn't just me. And so together we put together Tenacious and originally it was mostly women incarcerated in Oregon with one or two submissions from elsewhere. Uh, as time went on, uh, word about Tenacious spread. We, like, se we sent announcements to the Women's Prison Book Project and other organizations that worked with incarcerated women to let them know, to send out announcements and let them know that this was a zine that was free to incarcerated women. And from there, uh, word spread and the list grew. As time also went on, the other women started to drift away from the project. It's a time-consuming project to uh, work with incarcerated women. Oftentimes, uh, the submissions, pretty much all of the time, the submissions come in pen and paper letters. So you get a letter in the mail and it's usually handwritten. Sometimes it's a little hard to decipher and you have to type this up and lay it out. Sometimes the writing is not as evocative or explanatory as it could be. Uh, oftentimes women, this is the first time women have actually written about their experiences and so sometimes there's a back and forth uh, between the incarcerated woman and us on the outside where we're saying like hey could you clarify this or what does this term mean or instead of saying things like it was terrible can you say what it was and can you describe what was so terrible about it so this is time consuming work it's not always it doesn't often feel rewarding and so people started drifting off um, until I was the sole edit, outside editor of Tenacious. And at the same time, the women incarcerated in Oregon began being released, which was good news. Uh, and they, their contributions were replaced by other women's contributions. It's predominantly uh, women who are incarcerated in the women's prison in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, whereas later zines, the last two issues are predominantly written by women incarcerated in the Oklahoma prison system. And that's because oftentimes when one woman gets a copy of Tenacious, she will pass it around or let other people in her housing unit or her program look at the zine, which I should add in prison is actually prohibited. You're not allowed to share items while in prison. So she does this at great risk to herself. Um, she could be issued what's known as a disciplinary ticket, which means that you, ha you get a ticket and that results in, say, a loss of privileges, like you can't uh, call home for a week, or you're not allowed to shop at the prison store, or you're not allowed to do certain things that uh, might seem small until you realize that those are the things that keep you um, sane in, you know, the prison system, and, you know, more, uh, and could also land you in solitary confinement, which is being confined to a small cell the size of a bathroom for 23 and a half hours a day, simply for sharing uh, something. So at great risk to herself, she shares the zine with other women in her housing unit, and then other women will write in and say, hey, you know, uh, I want to, how do I get my own copy of the zine, or I would like to share my experience. Um, so the women around uh, in that housing unit or in that program will share the zine with each other, and then more women will write in. So you can see as Tenacious goes along how uh, how it 
how the focus shifts, you know, geographically as women inside share with each other and then get released and then other women in other prisons share with each other and continue to write for the zine. Can you show us a bit of like what's in these zines? Um, yes. A story or two? Or mm -hmm. Yes, so this one uh, from 2009, uh, there are stories from women incarcerated in New Jersey, in Colorado. This is one of my favorite illustrations uh, done by a woman incarcerated in Pueblo, Colorado. And they talk about issues like being, uh, having their cells searched, which is not necessarily just that somebody picks something up and puts it back down. It is literally, it, it's like those shows that you, those police shows you see where people, where the police come into your house and they tear everything apart. They like overturn your, all of your belongings and they throw them on the floor and they rip up your, you know, your say like, you know, like, bag of flour or your bag or in prison like your bag of chips and empty all the chips onto the floor so that that way they can ascertain that you don't have anything illegal in this sealed bag of chips um in prison this also means that they end up with their loved ones photos so photos of their children or drawings of their children sent them on the floor sometimes they get stepped on either deliberately or accidentally in this search and the women are taken out of their cells and they're often forced to kneel in the hallway facing the wall so they can't see what's happening but they can hear things being overturned things being torn and there's just a trauma that comes with that and this is just a regular functioning of the prison system that we don't think about when we think about prisons so they talk about um, cell searches um, one woman talks about going to the dentist uh, for a pain in her, her, her jaw, and it turned out she had an abscess, but the dentist again and again sends her away, saying like, you know, like it's really nothing, it's just a little toothache, take some Tylenol, which you can buy for $2 at the prison commissary, and go away, and it turns out that she has an abscess that could have uh, killed her. Um, so they talk about all sorts of different aspects of being in prison. Some women just write poetry, uh, about things um, and then there's also in nearly every issue writings by trans women incarcerated in men's prisons some of them talk about just being trans in a trans woman in a men's facility um, and you know like what that means for them some of them are give more practical how-to type of tips uh, one woman in one issue talked about how to get the medical care people to actually give you hormones and the steps that she took. So it's very much like a listicle, like step one, do this. The projects you're working on now. So the projects I'm working on now are less scene related and more book related. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm an author. Uh, one of my books is, uh, my first book is Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women, which specifically looks at the resistance and organizing happening in women's prisons and among women in prison, meaning all women in prison, jails, and detention centers, uh, meaning that it's focused on what women themselves are doing to challenge and change the conditions of their incarceration, whether it be to change the conditions inside the jails, prisons, or detention centers, or to change the policies and ways in which they entered the prison system. Um, I just finished a book uh, that I co-authored with Maya Shenwar, who is the editor-in-chief of a news website called Truth Out, called Prison by Any Other Name, and it looks at ways in which popularly proposed alternatives to the prison system, such as electronic monitoring, actually widen the net of who gets entrapped and doesn't do anything to actually address the underlying issues of incarceration. And then I'm finishing another book, um, which doesn't have a title yet, uh, about uh, popular myths of mass incarceration and why they're wrong. And this is particularly important because here in the United States, criminal justice reform has finally caught hold of public attention. Politicians are talking about it. Even this White House is talking about criminal justice reform. And But some of these discussions and proposals about criminal justice reform rely on myths that are just wrong. And if you use the and if you base your policies around myths such as private prison corporations drive mass incarceration then the solutions you come up with don't actually work because they're based on uh, flawed 
or unrealities in the first place. So those are the two big projects I'm working on right where, now. Where can people learn more about you? Uh, I have a website, victorialaw.net, um, and I have a Twitter feed at L-V-I-K-K-I-M-L. -K -K